be reading Exodus chapter 5 through Exodus 6, verse 1. I know it's a whole chapter, but it's not real long. Exodus chapter 5, page 93 in your pew Bible. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they said, What is the Lord God of Israel? This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, Well, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people and the lands are now of the land are now numerous, and you're stopping them from working. Well, that same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go out and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy, and that's why they're crying out. Let us go sacrifice to our God. We'll make the work harder for them. So they'll keep working and pay no attention to these lies. Then the slave driver and the overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says, I will give you no more straw. You can get, get it on your own, wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work that's required of you for each day, just as, you had, just as when you had the straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers that they had appointed them, and they were demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks today? Or yesterday? Or as before? When the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, Make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. And Pharaoh said, you're lazy. That's what it is. You are lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go sacrifice to the Lord. Now go get to work. You will not be given any straw, and you must produce your full quota of bricks. Well, the Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told that you are not to reduce the number of bricks. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting for them. And they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials, and you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, why Lord, why have you brought this trouble on these, on these people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on these people, and you have not rescued them at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. You may be seated. Who is the Lord to you? I actually love this passage. And I love it when Pharaoh says, So who's the Lord that I should obey him and let him go? And I can remember as a kid being on the playground, I got in a few scuffles. A few. Spent a couple days at home because of it, but I got, I got into a few scuffles. But I can remember even as a kid... There, there was a phrase where people would tout you because of who your dad is or what they thought your dad wasn't. Well, who's your dad think he is? 
in past experiences of having a few one-on-ones with my father, I could give you some pretty good idea who my dad was. The man was not afraid. He certainly wasn't afraid of me. (laughs) But the man was not afraid. So I could proceed to tell them who he was. I'm telling you, you don't want to mess with my dad. I tried it once. I don't remember anything after that. You know, it's just one of those things where you, you, you talk about your father in such a fashion to where there's so much pride about who he is, even though you had to learn it the hard way. <laughs> but you understand who he was. So here's Moses, and we've got to get, we've got to get this in our minds and, and understand some of the backstory and remember the backstory. Uh, that, that's really the key. Because Moses had spent time out in the wilderness with the Lord, hadn't he? His introduction to God was a burning bush. That would get my attention. Yours? Absolutely. So all of a sudden it's like, okay, so I am connecting with this God that nature obeys. That's a big deal. So Moses, in his time in the wilderness understood who this God is, right? Intimate knowledge of who this God is. So much so that Moses, who had a problem speaking, would say, God, no, I'm not going to go to the children of Israel because I just can't speak well. Well, take your brother, okay? Here's the key. Moses went... Period. Moses believed so much in the God that connected with him that he would go do what God told him to do. That's how much he trusted, believed, and understood God. There was a fear that Moses had. A fear. It was a healthy fear I had of my father. It was a healthy fear that Moses had for God. God could bless him abundantly. I'll take you out and make another one just like you. Right? It, it's, it's really, and, I, and I'm, I'm not being sacrilegious by any, by any means. The fact of the matter is, God can snuff us out and He can take us out. Is that His heart's desire? Absolutely not. But He has that power. And He has that power to bless us so that our lives are more and abundantly what we could ever imagine, just exceedingly over what we could ever comprehend that God could do with our lives. It's both. It's not either or. It's both and. God is a God of love and care and concern, and He's a God of judgment. Right? He is. Moses knew that. So Moses enters with Aaron and Pharaoh and says, The Lord God of Israel says, Let my people go. Now, if it was me, I would be hoping, Okay, I'm, I'm praying that, that Pharaoh has heard of you. I pray that Pharaoh has heard of you. Obviously, Pharaoh had not. Because this is Pharaoh's response. Who is the Lord that I should obey Him? Now, When I read that, and in my experiences of life, and and in my experiences with God, everything in me goes, Oh man, you're going to find out. This is not going to be good for you. Believe me, I know, I've experienced it. But Pharaoh says, because who is he? Who is he that I should obey him? You can tell that Pharaoh through this this passage, that Pharaoh really doesn't get it. Because not only does he question who God is, but he goes, you know what? I'm going to make it harder on his kids. I'm going to make it harder. Not bringing you any more straw. You're going to have to continue to make as many bricks as you had before. You've got to keep your quota. The whole while, Moses and Aaron are waiting for Pharaoh's response to, okay, he's not going to let him go, and he's doing this, 
And then word comes back, he's doing this, and it just keeps adding up. The slave drivers do what Pharaoh tells them to do. And the people of Israel have to work more and more and more. So much so that they were not able to make their quota. And not making their quota, and then they start getting beaten. And it gets worse. But Moses is like, but God, I have, I've done what you've asked. Why isn't it working out perfect? Like the plan that I had in my head. You didn't tell me what was going to happen. You told me to go do this, and I obeyed you. And I, I, I put it out there. Man, I went out on a limb, and I, I, I walked before Pharaoh... And, and I just said, let my people go. Because the Lord God of Israel said. And you know what he said? He looked at me and said, who? You know how dumb that made me look? You ever been there? And God's like, nothing. So then the people of Israel decide to go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Why have you treated us this way? You want all these bricks done, but you're making it impossible for us to get that, to, to get all of them accomplished. That we're not able to, to fulfill the quota. Why are you making it so hard for us not for you to reach your goal? Go make bricks. <laughs> I'd like to say that to somebody sometime, wouldn't you? Go make bricks. You're lazy. Just go make bricks. Go make them. Just do what you're told. So the Israelite overseers of the, of the Israelite people, they, they didn't get anywhere with Pharaoh, so they decided to go to Moses and Aaron to go back to them. What have you done to us? What have you done to us? I thought you were supposed to be saving us. This is not saving at all. Moses hears this and he's like, you know what? That's a pretty good approach. God, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? In the last verse, chapter 6, verse 1, this is what God says. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Pharaoh. First and foremost, God called Noah out. I mean, Moses out. He called him out. Now you're going to see what I'm going to do. You didn't trust me. This is yet another lesson, Moses. I'm going to show you. But I'm coming to the schoolyard, Moses. I'm coming. And because of my mighty hand, he will let them go and he will drive them out of his country. There's a point in time when God decides that that's enough, and I'm going to show up. That's the God we serve, church. He may put plans in front of us, and he may ask us to do things, and they may not work out exactly what we think that they should, or what is safe or what is comfortable. But He's never left us. And he's never forsaken us. He will show up. And when He does, you will know it. And that's what happened with the whole story. The Lord is mighty and He is powerful. He is our Creator. He's a healer. He is our Savior. He's the giver of life. God is capable he is creative. He is forgiving. He's honest. He's all knowing. And he is the lover of our souls. God is not one to mess with. He isn't. My kids have asked me before Dad, why do you ask us to do things? You know, your dad, you could just tell us what to do. I ask because I'm trying to be nice. 
right? I ask because I'm being nice. I ask, but subliminally there is not an option not to do what I've just asked you to do. Right? It's true. Yeah, could you take the trash out? No. What? Did you hear what I just said to you? You're not up off that couch. I don't hear feet on the floor. But you asked me. No, I didn't. We've all been there. And it's one of those things to go, you know what? Through Scripture, you really don't see God asking. Moses, I just lit up this bush over here. I want you to give your life to me, and I want you to go tell, my, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. No question in Moses' mind that he was asking. He was not asking. But to be able to read that last part where God is saying, you will now see, Moses, and Pharaoh will know who I am. That church is your God. That church is your Father. He is the one that has no problem stepping onto the playground after he has been made fun of to make things right. That's who you serve. That's who you've given your life to. He comes in force. Each one of us could talk about stories in our own lives where God showed up, and He showed up in a powerful way where it put me on my knees. That's who He is. That's why in the Scriptures, and especially you see it in the Gospels, um, and in Acts, and where men fell like dead men. Do you remember reading about that? There's different times when God shows up. The, tomb, the, soul, the stones rolled away from the tomb, and people fell down like dead men. The glory of God showed up and they were blind or they fell. That's one of those things where you're in such a powerful presence that your knees buckle. Have you ever been in a situation like that? It can be something that's very traumatic, but at the same time, when God shows up, His glory comes in such a fashion that you can't stand up. And that's why it's written in Scriptures that way. Because men fall down, literally. Because the presence of His spiritual glory is so strong that your physical makeup can't take it. That's who your father is. That's happened before when my physical father walked in the room after a few things. Ian? Oh, no. And your knees go weak and you're like, oh, man, here it comes. Fully deserved it, but here it comes. But that authority that we have at points experienced in our lives on this earth is an example of the spiritual authority that comes into our lives when God says, I'm calling on you to X, Y, Z. To be this. To get rid of this in your life. To step out and say this to someone. We need to have a, a healthy understanding that at points God doesn't ask You signed on to be in the family. Again, I could stand up here and quote my dad all day. You're part of this family. When I hit to be a teenager, it's time to pull your weight. It's time to be this. It's time to do that. You're a Thornton. You know what? Man, I'm a Christ follower. That's it. And this is what we've signed on for. But it's the understanding that we're not left out there alone. And when God says it's, it's when He's done being made fun of, when He's done being questioned, He shows up. And that's who we serve. So the question is, in our own lives at this point in time, who do we need God to be? Do we need Him to be our sanity? Do we need Him to be our guide, our hope, our healer, our stability? Because you know what? He's all of that. 
And it's in these points and times in our lives that we get to experience His specific character in our lives that is so personal that allows us to become what it is that He's designed us to be. For us to let go of the fear, to let go of the regret, the hurts, the pains, the feelings of betrayal, all of those things. He will take it, own it, swallow it, and spit it out. Because that's not of Him, it's of the enemy. And on the cross, He's already defeated Him. So therefore, what the enemy comes against us with has already been defeated. Just let Him do it. Give it to Him. That's your Father. That's your Father. Powerful, almighty, ever-loving, but a judge. But He loves us greatly. And the things that we can't handle and the things that break us down are His to handle. They're His. They're not ours. They're His. So give it to Him. Let it go. Let Him be that powerful force that's going to show up on the playground to defend you. That's going to prove to your Pharaoh... This is who I am, and you will never forget this day. He will step in with power and might. Let him. Father, Lord God, I thank you for this day that you've given us and how you've blessed us. Father, I thank you for these pictures that you give us of who you are, your strength, your power, your might. But Father, your loving kindness towards us. Father, you're a defender of your children. When you are questioned, you will show up. Father, you're you're the lover of our souls. God, I ask you for your blessing. And God, I ask for your courage that it would just fall upon each one of us, that we would just let these things go. Father, those things in our lives that hold us down, that, that make life more difficult than it needs to be. Father, these things we can just release to you. We can give to you and we can let you have and take control of it. Father, thank you. Thank you for being what we need. And thank you for meeting us where we are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.